This is Mitch Steven with the 1000houses.com podcast, and I have a very special guest today. His name is Eddie Speed. We go way back, probably don't even want to talk about how far we go back because that would make us old, okay? But we've been friends for a long time, and we have had endless, and I do mean endless conversations, like they still haven't ended. We're going to have another conversation today after all these years about what's going on and how to navigate it and what's working and what's not working. Eddie, a little background on Eddie, probably one of the premier note buyers in the United States, bought over uh, 40,000 seller finance notes in his career, billions of dollars worth. I, I'm pretty sure it's billions. You know, the guy's just been in the business for uh, over a few decades. And whenever you stay in one, one focus that long, you got to learn some things and you got to know a little bit about what you're talking about. I mean, even the dumbest guys could be in the business this long and learn something, right? So, hey, Eddie, how you how doing? You doing how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So there's some interesting statistics out lately. We were talking earlier. Why don't we just start with that right there? Let's talk about who the likely motivated sellers are and some of the statistics that are out there right now that you might not believe as a listener. So while everything is great in real estate, Mitch, there are some things that are underwater. There are some things in the people in the marketplace that are experiencing situations that it's not been pleasant for them. I like to say this, Mitch, for the small time landlord, the market has been great to them. The tenants have been terrible to them. And that means to me that there are a lot of people that particularly with changes in the tax rates on the horizon, the people need to reposition themselves. And Mitch, sometimes it's smart to take money, some money off the table, right? Particularly if owning these rentals has caused way more of a job than they bargained for. Not long ago, Forbes, literally. Can, some, I, ask, can yeah. I ask you a question though? So yeah. you said the market's been great to them, but the renters have been bad. Is this in large part because of the laws that they passed or the, the, the mandates that they, you couldn't collect rent or where, or was it just... Yeah crappy tenants well there's mitch call it i want to use some round numbers but i'm very close uh, in these numbers right i'm not way off in percentage call it 17 million properties are owned by people that are defined as a small landlord five houses or less some people say four houses or less right so that's a that's kind of an industry definition urban institute the Census Bureau, a number of different people report these numbers slightly differently, but it's all within that realm. Okay, 50% of those small landlords don't have a mortgage. They got equity, right? And so people wonder why they haven't seen more defaults with small landlords. Not that there's not defaults in there. There certainly are. But a lot of these people, the reason they don't have a default is they didn't have a mortgage. But what's happened is, and Forbes did an article, I think that came out very recently, and there's, there's, there's quotes in, in, in magazines every week about it, or uh, Black Knight does some really good reports on it. And basically, here's the deal, 58% of the small landlords, right, 58% experience rent slippage during the virus. Now, that's an amazing number. It's a horrible number if you're a landlord. So what we have discovered is we, we call them burnout landlords, right? You, it, because, and, and here's the thing, three quarters of these landlords, Mitch, you can relate to this from your earliest days in the business when you didn't know better. They self-manage their rentals. What do you think their vetting process is? Probably not very good. So now you've defined pain. Mitch, I've known you, I heard you say it when I came on. I mean, I, I think I've known you around since 1995, 96, somewhere in there. And we've known each other really well a long time. And we know because we've seen so many people cycle through the business. People buy a rental thinking they're making an investment and they found out they bought a job. Absolutely. So you have made the most money in your real estate business by defining a motivated seller. True? You're, yep, that's where, that's, you're where a, the rubber, that's where the rubber meets the road. You got to find a deal. You're a rock star at it, right? So I see real estate investors, and a lot of them are really high volume guys. 
but they're, I think they may be too generalized. And I'm trying to give like a window for like some people that aren't necessarily the top 100 house buyers that might be on today. Top 100 house buyers probably all know me and you, Mitch. <laughs> they probably have already heard us say this offline somewhere. But the truth of the matter is, what if you're not a giant operator? And how do you want to go find a market that maybe the big guys, to be perfectly honest with you, might be passing over the top off? So here's the thing, highly motivated seller with equity. And by the way, Mitch, they've owned that rent house for a few years. The market's been very kind to them. They have big appreciation, which means they have a tax liability. Mitch, what if you owned a rental and I said to you, Mitch, I have a strategy that most real estate investors don't know about and very few apply well. Your accountant may not suggest it to you. He would know about it, but he wouldn't think of it. And you might not have thought of it. Did you know that you could sell your property and defer your capital gains tax over a long period of time? Are you interested? Man, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, just the way you phrase that right there, that's beautiful. You're at least going to get heard. So you and I know the deal, right? It's something that we've done tens of thousands of times now, which is called installment sales. And you are taking your income over the life of the, when you get the money back, when you collect it. But a landlord wouldn't have thought of that. A guy that owns four rentals doesn't really know the laws of the, that world. And his accountant is probably more likely an accountant of a dress shop than he is a real estate investor. So even though he passed his CPA, and I'm sure they're very smart, they don't know everything about every industry. This is niche. And it's a terrific opportunity for us to start the conversation of how you could take your gain over time. And that is that you're going to offer seller financing. Yep. And like you said, most of the people won't think of that. But the way you prefaced it was great. Can you say that again? So, like I, you pretend, you so I do well in a house call situation, Mitch. So you're, you're, my, you're my customer, right? Now I'm, your, I, I'm, I'm a landlord. I got this house. I don't owe anything on it. It's worth... $350,000 now over because the last two years it exploded and I, I'm worn out. I'm old. I just want, I don't want to work so hard anymore. These people are killing me. Mitch, I'm a real estate investor, but I'm, I'm sort of a specialist and I, I have, I help people with strategies that not every real estate investor knows. In fact, most don't know the strategy that I'm going to tell you about because there's a little known fact that the IRS has allowed for years and fully allows it today for you to stretch out your capital gains tax over many years. And I can show you how you could do that. Now, I'm not giving you tax advice, Mitch. I'm simply saying I'm a business guy with tax knowledge. Are you interested in learning about that? Yes, I am. Tell me more. Okay, so, I mean, there's the pitch, guys, right there. I mean, it's, it's not complicated. It's a lot better than just like, uh, will you take payments? You know, they don't understand. Well, no, I don't want payments. What if I don't get my payments? I don't, why would I take payments? He's telling you, tell them there's a reason for them to take payments, a great big reason with probably a dollar amount attached to it that you could figure out pretty, pretty, pretty quick if you had a calculator. You need two things. You need the calculator and you need to know what income tax bracket he's in so you can do the math and say, this is what it saves you. Yeah, and it's typical thinking for you and I, Mitch, because you and I own our finance property that we have capital gains in. You know, you know that like you, I'm also in the land business. In fact, it's a great business. I have a great partner, great relationship with the guys I'm involved with. And we have some land that we're selling and we have a very good profit in it. But we, want, we don't want to go pay all that tax today and we stretch it out. Well, that's our real story. So why wouldn't it be every landlord out there that has a lift in value and has got a tax liability? Yep, same thing. I mean, I sell my houses with seller finance notes for a reason. And when someone comes and pays me off, I almost rue the day. You know what I mean? Like, damn it, you know, you know, I'm going to have to pay. I didn't need all this money right now, you know? It's exactly right. Yeah. So where are you most likely to find these guys? Or I guess you're looking for, yeah, where are you most likely to find these people? Well, the good news is everything I'm describing to you is data that anybody in the house buying business ought to be able to learn how to find. I mean, I can go scrape data with a lead with a with a with a data source, a, a list source, and say, give me small landlords. Give me small landlords that have owned a house at least three years 
with either low equity or all equity. In fact, Mitch, we run a campaign ourselves. So, you know, I'm in the note business, but I was, part of my business is I buy these houses from landlords and create my own notes and, of course, sell them on a wrap. So I'm creating my own paper, just like you do, right? But one of the reasons I did that, Mitch, to be perfectly honest with you, is I, I saw what an underserved market this was. And so I'm like, well, it, you know, it's great to teach somebody else, but this is too good for us not to go do. And that's, that's exactly what we shifted around and did. These landlords, the conversation about a tax strategy that they've never been suggested before is an amazing icebreaker to it, you. You caught it, right? It's but it's an amazing icebreaker to the conversation. Yeah, it also shows you're different than everybody else. You're actually trying to uh, help them out instead of just get a deal for yourself. You know what I mean? It, it, there's a lot to be said for uh, giving before you ask. You know what I mean? Like, like, and then they hold you in a different place in their mind. You're not just one of those guys. You're that other guy that really brought some value to to the table ups your odds a lot of being able to, to, to buy that house. It also puts me in a different price band of a house bracket, Mitch. So we, our minimum house that we will solicit is worth 150,000 minimum. We won't, we won't, we won't even solicit because we tell the list vendor, we won't even solicit a house that's worth less than 150,000 because Mitch, if they carry the financing for us, and let's just say an average of 2% interest, there's all kinds of ways to finagle it and do, but just say an average of 2% interest. Even if I sell the house at a much lower interest rate than your normal rate, because on a $350,000 house, it's going to become a rate sensitive. Yes. But if I even sell that house, Mitch, and do a wrap note, and I'm collecting 6% interest, I'm paying two, I'm getting six, I got a pretty good bank going. Now you could damn near sell it for what you bought it for and come out just you'd be making four percent on your on someone else's money which is good so then any any equity or any discount you get below that starts moving your rate up your roi up pretty fast yeah and mitch here's what happens if i set myself self up correctly what happens to me is this guy that owner financed it this burnout landlord He's going to wake up in five years, two years, five years, seven years. I don't know when, but I have bought literally today. I guess I need to update my bio. I've bought over 50,000 notes. So I can tell you from experience, he's going to want to sell his note. And if I write the note correctly, I put a first right of refusal in it where some old note buyer like Eddie Speed can't get, get to it because the real estate investor has got his own first right of refusal to buy his own note. And then all of a sudden, I can make profit way down the road by buying my own debt at a discount. Yeah, and I can speak from experience. That almost always happens. When someone seller finance your house, it's just a matter of time till their circumstance comes up. And if you remind them every year, they'll find a circumstance, whether they have one or not, so that they have to get the money out, you know, and so they have to sell at a discount. And when I say remind them, you know, sometimes when we got our eye on a property that we we'd like to reduce our debt on or or strengthen a little bit in the profit department we will send out letters you know once a year just saying hey if you ever think about selling that note or if you ever need some cash uh, you know let me know and we'll, we'll we'll do something with this note you know just plant the seed that they have they can liquefy that note anytime they want they don't have to take the payments what they will find out sooner or later when they call you to liquidate is that it's going to cost them a little bit to get their hands on that money. And yeah, and there's even, there's even some, there's even techniques. I don't want to get too complex in the conversation today, but there's techniques where I can buy some of the payments without all of the payments, right? I could buy five years, next five years of their payments or next eight years of their payments without having to buy all 20 years of it. And that's a partial, which is, you know, we perfected that strategy really well. And Here's the thing, Mitch, once you buy those five years of payments, then they will end up selling you the rest of the note. And that's almost 100% of the time. Well, it's kind of like crack cocaine. You know, they got a little bit, got to have some more, <laughs> got to have the rest it. of it. Can't leave it sit on the table now. So very interesting. So partials, you know, 
Eddie used to tell me about partials all the time. And I, I'm a living proof. I'm a slow learner. You know, I, I'll, I'll come to that conclusion when, when I'm damn well ready, Eddie, to accept a theory. And so one day, many years after Eddie'd been trying to explain it to me, I ran to Eddie all excited because I said, you know, I, if, if I hold like, you know, two or if I had just held two or three years of all the notes I sold in my life, I'd be worth another kabillion dollars. And Eddie looked at me and said, you know, I've been trying to tell you that for at least 10 and a half years, you know, like, like, you know, <laughs> you know and, 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 you know, the teacher appears when the student's ready. Sometimes you're just not, you just don't, aren't ready. And it amazes me because the, even today, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in this game. And there are revelations that I wish I would have understood years ago that I'm just now starting to really sink down to my core, you know, and I don't know what it is, but. Mitch, I use well, you in an example all the time. You don't know this, but I do. <laughs> do tell. I, I bought Mitch well over a thousand portfolios of notes, not a thousand notes, a thousand packages of notes, groups of notes, many from you. In, in years past. And I tell people, there are a few people in the business, one of them is my friend Mitch Steven in San Antonio, that figured out how to recapitalize his note business. And then he built a bank. And so there are people think that they only want to do real estate investing and only want to create notes, right? But what the, the real art of the deal, Mitch, what you really perfected, better than a lot of people that ever tried it in front of you, is that you figured out these recapitalization techniques. And when you do that, then all of a sudden you, you could, like if a guy wanted to sell five years worth of payments, you'd figure out a way to raise some private money and buy those five years worth of payments. It wouldn't have to come out of your checking account. And now all of a sudden what you're really doing is you're dealing with some inexpensive private money that are putting money into your investments that have a much higher yield than your, than your passive investor is getting. Now you own a bank. And that really is the art of the deal. And I use you as an example all the time. And I've got to help you with some of those ideas. And some of them you came up on your own. And some of them you and I beat up 10,000 times together. Yeah. But this is, this is why you've made your real estate business a wealth business. And you've done that really well, Mitch. Well, thank you. And it, and it, it, it took a village, you know, because I'm not, I never considered myself the sharpest pencil in the drawer, you know, but I burn my hand on the stove enough times I'll figure out which burner's hot, you know what I mean? And which one's not. So what I liked about, you know, your mastermind that you had, and when, you know, I went to your mastermind, you have this very interesting concept. Most people are going in trying to get a price and you're like, screw the price. Just figure out what's more important to the guy, the price or the, figure out what the seller wants and, and buy what orchestrate an offer that, is in his ballpark and what he wants. And, and one of the things that you brought to the forefront of my mind and kind of said, damn, I, you know, I know this, but I keep letting it go. It doesn't matter the price. I, you know, if, if you get the right terms, it doesn't matter the price. And there's always a set of terms that you could win at any price. And here's a really bad example, but let's say I'm trying to buy a $200,000 house for a million and the guy wants a million dollars and the house is clearly only worth 200,000. I can always make up a set of terms that I can win at. And that set of terms off the top might be, yeah, I can buy it for a million. I just can't have a payment for 30 years. I mean, that's a crappy example, but there's always a set of terms that'll outrun the problem of the price. That's it. And this one, basically I won't be alive in 30 years. So who cares about making the payment? It's a bad example. I understand, but get my point. Well, and once again, you know, I think creative financing is a mindset. I, I like it. Uh, so I wake up a lot of mornings, Mitch, you know, very focused on the next idea, the next strategy, the next position. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be like really super transparent with you in the audience. Okay. Everything about installment sales, everything about burnout landlords, none of that, as you well know, Mitch, is new with me. None of that's new. Like it's, it's, it, it, I've made it a cornerstone of something I've been focused on, certainly since the virus is, is the burnout landlord. And installment sales is something that you and I've been dealing with our whole career in the business because it's how we've sold property. 
So this none of those were new ideas. So what happened was is the new administration said they were going to make some tax proposals, which are pretty pretty sure that there's going to be most of those are going to end up down the way, particularly related to capital gains. Now, Mitch, there's a big monster on the horizon that Biden has proposed, which is if you have capital gains of over a million dollars, that they're essentially going to double the capital gains rate. Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a big problem. So when, but when that came out initially, like, like for a period of time, I wasn't clear that the, that it was only on a million dollars and above. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the best sales hook I've ever seen. I, I, I'd have voted for Biden if I'd have known he'd come up with such a great idea for me, right? <laughs> no, you wouldn't have. <laughs> so, I know you too well, man. Don't start playing now, Eddie. <laughs> because I'm like, everybody's going to have to sell this year and take installment sales or next year they're going to pay double the tax. So that's what initially gave me the idea on laying the income down or the tax liability down. It's standing up, right? It's due all at one time, lay it down and then pay it over a long period of time. And so then all of a sudden in, in, in more investigation, okay, it's the, the guys under a million dollars, their tax rate aren't going to be as affected, not double. Okay. But then all of a sudden it dawned on me, wait a minute, they've never thought of this. Then all of a sudden, the, all the things that I was going to go tell the marketplace because they'd never considered it, I realized that the small landlords never thought of this anyway. And his accountants probably never thought of it because his accountant's not like you're in my accountant. He's not used to note transactions. Isn't it amazing, Eddie, how this exact theory that you, the, the way the pitch, the whole mindset of looking at it would have been a great pitch even 20 years ago. Exactly. Any, any time. And it takes us all these years to like go, oh my God, what if you'd have had that tactic, you know, in the beginning, from the very beginning, you'd be worth another fortune. You know what I mean? You know, uh, the old saying, right? It only takes five minutes to come up with a great idea. You just don't know which five minutes it's going to be. Yeah. This one's, you know, three decades down the road. Uh, I have revelations like that all the time. And that's one of the reasons I do these podcasts is because I get to talk to some pretty damn smart people, i.e. Eddie Speeds. You know, he's no dumbass, especially when you start talking to him about what, what he knows. You know, I talked to a guy the other day. He says, what happens? How many houses do you have to look at to buy a house? You know, everybody throws out like 25, whatever. I thought, yeah, I don't know, 25, I guess. He says, what are you doing with the other 24? I said, you know, I walk out of the house. I never look back. He goes, have you ever thought about having a real estate agent in, in, in your office and and getting your closers, teaching your, your acquisition people, once they realize they can't buy it, to, to go ahead and, and set the appointment to sign the listing, not to talk about a listing, to, to sell the listing. And I said, no. He says, well, let me show you how it works. We started a month ago on that, and we, we've closed seven and got seven commissions already. And I think to myself, in a career, I mean, I bought 2,500 houses in my career. And if if you go through 25 to buy one, that's thousands of houses, thousands upon thousands. If I had picked up every, you know, seven or 10, every 25 houses and commissions. It, anyways, my point is these revelations keep happening even to the old dogs, like, you know, you and me, the, the, you know, you can, you can teach old dogs new tricks. Probably the old dog invents the new trick because they're, you know, they keep trying. My sales manager, my sales manager, Derek, he's a, he was sales manager at big car dealerships, sales manager or finance manager, but most profitable entity in a car dealership is a is finance department. It's not the sales department. It's not car sales. So he used to be more of a finance manager than he was just sales manager because he controlled the biggest profit in the dealerships. These are big dealerships, guys that have 50 sales guys, right? And he says an old manager that he used to work for had a great saying, and that was bad ha habits are built in good times and good habits are built in bad times. So you and I have dealt with many years in the business over our stretch in the business where you could just make that 65 cent offer and buy all the houses you wanted. And now all of a sudden we're scrambling around there throwing out 90 cent numbers, right? And, and so now all of a sudden, I, I, the biggest, it seems to me, Mitch, the biggest guys in the business this year is their most profitable year. But most of the smaller operators who don't have the marketing and the sales process as tight as the biggest operators 
they're not doing as good. This is why I bring this up to the smaller guy. This is your unique advantage in the market. You may be at a disadvantage against the biggest house buyers in the business because you don't have the marketing machine they have, but they're not focused on this. I'll promise you they're not because you know I know a whole bunch of them. This is a niche. Yeah, it certainly is. You know, Eddie, I really appreciate this time with you. And, and I know that you're a busy guy. I don't want to occupy all your time. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your educational process. And we're going to send them over to the show notes. I'll have a link, 1000houses.com uh, forward slash Eddie Speed, okay? And we'll get over the show notes. But tell us about your, your educational opportunities and what you're offering to people that might, you know, need a change or need to reinvent themselves. Uh, there's a lot of money in the note buying business and it's just like any other business. So you got to get educated and you got to get good at it. You got to, you got to know what you're doing. And if you do, it can open up a whole other door. So tell us about your, your educational opportunities. So Mitch, today, I believe for somebody looking at creative financing or notes, I, th I think there are three, the three biggest opportunities are this burnout landlords for the obvious reasons that we've been discussing for the last few minutes, right? Secondly, there's four and a half million loans that aren't making a payment. So when everybody tells you that, that you know, there's no inventory, look, let me tell you something, there's an avalanche of, of defaulted loans coming down the pipe, call it an avalanche. And uh, you can buy those notes, you can buy them at a good discount. And uh, there's a huge profit with them. And so the non performing note business, Mitch, probably this cycle could be even better than 2010 believe it or oh, not, because we're not in such a injured real estate market. 2010, you could buy these notes for pennies on the dollar, but then you had to go full with them and sell them. So non-performing notes is the second big opportunity. And the third big opportunity, which you know very well, is that there's been not a better time really to offer seller financing because we're in a real estate boom, but a credit crisis. 35% of the people that could get a mortgage before the crisis cannot get one now. Right. This, this virus has caused mortgage underwriting to, to draw in, which means there's more people that good people, qualified people with big down payments that need seller financing than we've seen in many, many years. Those are the three, like if you understand those voids, there's some huge market opportunities to work around that. So we have a training process. We, we would love to get somebody to at least just calm down and hang out with us a day, just a day, and just then unfold these things and see like, if this is, if this market is, as Eddie's describing, well, how could I do it? And then if somebody gets a sense of how it works. So we've got a, we got a good book and it's, I, I named the book after the movie Moneyball, right? The baseball movie, because the Moneyball story is a guy that just looked at the same baseball game everybody else had been watching for a hundred years and just looked at through another set of eyes. And so I, I wrote a little book and it's about that. And it's a pretty good read, right? It's, a, it's about like how to look at it. It's like you described, how to look at a real estate deal in a different way. And then they can progress to us and go to a class that they'd like to do it. And just under, just spend enough time with us to see what, what is this creative financing thing? It's been pretty good to old, old Mitch Steven, you know. Very good. And uh, one thing about education, you can choose to go it on your own and go the internet and learn all you can, which is not a bad way. You can learn a lot of stuff there, but you're going to pay. You're going to pay one way or the other. You'll pay in lost opportunity, lost expertise, lost making mistakes, maybe even getting sued, doing things you're not supposed to be doing. You just don't know. Or you can just pay someone to go get right to it and have the confidence that someone who knows what they're doing can advise you on any of your questions. And that's like a different way to proceed, a way to proceed with a lot less anxiety. And I, I, I will argue till the cows come home, it's gonna be cheaper. You might not think it's cheaper because you see that number all at one time there, what going without specialized information, they're gonna chisel at you and you'll never know how much you really lost, but I guarantee it's gonna be way more than you would have paid. I guarantee it. Ask me how I know. I, I like to tell everyone I graduated from La Calle U. How's your Spanish, Eddie? Uh, La Calle means the street. The street, okay. And it is the most expensive diploma you will ever get. And matter of fact, they don't ever even give you one. They just kick you down the road, spit on you, grind your head into the dirt, and then say, get up if you can, you little bastard. You know? <laughs> 
and you look up and you spent two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in lost opportunity or, or or mistakes or lawsuits or you know a house you shouldn't have bought because you didn't know to check x or y or z and so you know hmm. the thing is you got to be committed when you go though either way you got to commit so get committed i want you to go to 1000houses.com forward slash eddie speed e-d-d-i-e speed s-p-e-e-d and over there will be all the show notes he'll give away i don't know you're giving away a copy of your book or what are you giving away you're giving away yeah, I'm, I've got, there's a copy of a book and, and we've got some a little presentation in there they can watch and uh, kind of take them a little further down the road about why people would want to learn this, why, why it matters to them. And uh, I think it'll be very helpful for them. Yeah. You know, I know you may, you may or may not want me to bring this up, but either way, you had this little calculator and it said, no matter what the price of this property was, this calculator, if you plug in the, the variables, it'll tell you how, you know, what, what offers to make to get the kind of IRI you want, you know, and it was an amazing little calculator. I, I, I love it because it just solves so much thinking, you know, or, or guessing is usually what we do. We just kind of, well, this will probably be good enough. So we thought the offer, I mean, that calculator, like really, really let you know what you were doing exactly to the T is yep. it still available through you? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we, there's a certain level of training people have that calculator and you know, I developed that with a guy that was in the mastermind with us, right? And I had this, I had the idea because once again, I just think my idea is like people don't know what they don't know until they know it. And so I think you have brought, you've brought up a good example today that we can sort of ignore price if we're clever enough in structuring terms. Yeah, That's okay, so, so example, that calculator would say, you know, there's a cash price that you can make 15% ROI on, but there's also... A, 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 a set of terms that you can make 15% IRR where you can pay more than the cash price and you could plug them in. And, and it was just very eye-opening at really the disparities in the prices and it's the same ROI. Exactly. It, it was really eye-opening, really eye-opening. And uh, I think it's really cool. So again, go to 1000houses.com forward slash Eddie Speed. That'll get you over the show notes. There'll be a place to contact. You can see his uh, little one day events, you know, where you can at least go and spend a day and kind of immerse yourself to see what the possibilities are and why it makes sense in this market, really any market, but the angles we're taking in this market, you know, everyone's had to adjust their angle. I don't care who you are. Everyone has had to adjust their angle because of COVID. We all had to adjust back in 2008 and 10 when the, when the recession hit. I mean, all business is really is the art of reinvention every cycle or so. And, and we never know how long the cycles are. So we're always prepared to reinvent. And so you got a guy here who's on the cutting edge. Check it out, 1000houses.com forward slash Eddie Speed and spend a day with him. What could it hurt? I mean, it, you know, and the cool thing is there's usually some pretty sharp people in that audience too. So your lunches and your breaks and your dinners in the evening are some pretty, pretty, jam-packed conversations that's one of the things that i think we lost when you had the zoom meetings and everything because of covid you know going to a seminar conventions you know are you doing all this stuff online or do you have it formal meetings? one day the one days for the most part are virtual just because it's too hard for somebody to travel for one day we still have advanced classes that we do both ways live or or whatever and stuff and you're right and you've I look at some of the friendships and relationships that you literally met because of coming to classes with me hanging out long time ago, like Fenolio, like you, like that's, th th there's relationships that have lasted 20 years, you know? Yeah, so, I, met, I met you because I went, I, I left the comfort of my home and I went someplace and look at all these years, we're still here. That happened during the break. That happened during lunch. I didn't, you know, you know what I mean? I didn't go to see Eddie. We didn't know who each other were, and there's a good reason why we didn't know. <laughs> All right, my friend, anything you want to add before maybe we wrap it up? Mitch, you're a good guy. You have been a great contribution to the business. Congratulations on uh, your health. You, you, uh, you look awesome, and uh, I know you're doing good, and uh, I love you, pal. I love you too, Eddie. It's been a long time and a great friendship for a long time. It's always my pleasure to talk to you because I always get something when I talk to you, always. And I hope I hope I return the favor sometime. If not, just send me a bill, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All 
All right, this is Mitch Steven with the 1000houses.com podcast. We've been talking to Eddie Speed. Check him out. Go over to 1000houses.com forward slash Eddie Speed and go over there and get a free copy of the download. Find out when he's uh, given some of these online uh, one day events so that you can feel around and see if this is for you. I have a, I have a notion that whether you do or you don't, you're going to see the possibilities because uh, Eddie's really good at painting that picture. And uh, that's one of the reasons why he's one of the best educators around because he can really paint the picture and he can put it down into the simplest lay, lay term, layman terms that you can possibly because if he was too complicated, I would have never been able to follow him. A guy can speak English like a cowboy, you know, so there you go. All right, we're out of here. Thanks for stopping by to get you some Eddie speed. We'll see you on the next episode.